down to the earth, putting his face between his knees. Now go up, he told his servant, and look out to the sea. He went up and looked. There is nothing at all, he said. Go back seven times, Elijah said. The servant rising from the seventh time, the servant said, now there is a cloud, small as a man's hand, rising from the sea. Elijah said, go and say to Ahab, harness the chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And with that, the sky grew dark with cloud and storm and rain fell in torrents. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. When the appointed time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born a subject of the law, to redeem the subjects of the law and to enable us to be adopted as sons. The proof that you are sons is that God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit that cries, Abba, Father. And it is this that makes you a son. You are not a slave anymore. And if God has made you son, then he has made you heir. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment the disciple made a place for her in his home. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, good evening. We gather on this great solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, gathered with our dear sisters in the spirit as they celebrate their patroness, gathered in this holy place to encounter Christ in the Eucharist, led by Mary herself. And as we gather here, I want you to gather your thoughts and walk backwards with me through time. Walk backwards past Therese and Elizabeth of the Trinity. Walk backwards past the great Carmelite martyrs of the French Revolution whom we celebrate tomorrow. Walk backwards past even Teresa and John Walk backwards past the 1450s when the first Carmelite nuns came. Walk backwards to taking a moment's pause, 1251, when Our Lady of Mount Carmel, according to tradition, appeared to St. Simon Stock and gave him the Carmelite habit. I want you to go even further back than that to a foreign land where foreign men, in some sense broken by the world, perhaps pilgrims, perhaps crusaders, all except one anonymous, gathered on the slopes of a mountain, gathered in a valley on the western face of Mount Carmel, just south of Haifa. And these men, nameless to us, built a small chapel to Our Lady. And as far as we know, this is the first Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And these men went to St. Albert the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and asked for a rule. And he gave them the primitive rule of the Carmelite observance, in which there are many good things, many practical things, many things which he borrowed from St. Augustine in particular, because he himself was a canon. But there's one thing that St. Albert pointed out that I want to sit with today, that in a very short rule he spends many words describing and that is silence. From the earliest days 
Our Lady of Mount Carmel was surrounded by silence. And as you picture those first Carmelites in a valley on the western face of Mount Carmel, I want to tell you a little bit about it, because knowing that it's the Holy Land, you might think of it as an arid place, a dry place, a place of rock and sand, and it's not that at all. It is a verdant place. It is a beautiful place. A place of terebinth and oak, kebab and mastic, sage and broom, poppy and iris, orchid and tulip. A place well watered. A place whose very name means garden. Carmel means garden in Hebrew. And so I want you to think of that Mount Carmel as a reflection on earth of the paradise from which we fell. A place given over now to contemplation and to love. And we know 1,700, 1,800 years before these first Carmelites, Elijah himself stayed on this mountain. That's a bigger jump than all the other jumps I did, okay? <laughs> but I wonder if, and this is mere speculation, but I wonder if in between those first Carmelites and Elijah and Elisha, there was a special visitor to this garden a special visitor to this reflection of Eden. I wonder if she, who is the new Eve, walked upon the slopes of Carmel. I don't know, but it's not preposterous because Carmel is a mere day's walk away from Nazareth. In fact, Carmel is closer to Nazareth than Capernaum is. And we know that her son learned from somewhere to always go up on a mountain to pray. And is it possible that the Blessed Virgin Mary, the new Eve, inspired by the Holy Spirit, herself set foot on Carmel, and walking through the garden of God, offered to him her silence. Dear brothers and sisters, in all of scripture, we hear Mary give six quotations, only six. She tells the angel, how can this be since I have not known man? She tells the angel, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. She tells um, Jesus. Well, first she tells Elizabeth the Magnificat. And then she tells Jesus, where have you been? Your father and I were looking for you. Then, as her fifth saying, this is why we love you, out of six times speaking, she spends one saying, they're out of wine. And I understand that, and I get that, and I appreciate it. But the last time we hear her voice in all of Scripture, it is to give her great command. Do whatever he tells you. And yet, dear brothers and sisters, tonight I want to meditate not on the speech of Our Lady, but of her silence. She was silent in Nazareth after the Annunciation, silent in this place where the Word himself became flesh, and she shut her mouth. I feel sorry for Joseph. Clearly Joseph had no idea what was going on. Why? Because she was silent. She was silent in Bethlehem as 
angels and shepherds come and start adoring her son and crying out glory to God. And it merely says that she kept all these things pondering on them in her heart. She was silent in the whole ministry of Galilee as her son was walking around, working miracles, preaching the word, raising the dead, and she even went to meet him. And it seems that he rebuked her, and she greeted him with silence. She was silent, dear brothers and sisters. as she stood by the cross, as we heard today in the gospel. Silent as he gave her to us. There is a place in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre that actually it, they have Calvary, where the Lord is crucified, and they have a little shrine with a candle that marks where Mary stood contemplating her son in silence. In the upper room where his Eucharistic body was consecrated on Holy Thursday, where she who gave birth to his physical body came to pray with the apostles, in the upper room on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and they all start speaking in tongues and they rush outside to convert the whole world as she gives birth to him in the church on Pentecost Day, gives birth to us. She is silent. She is silent in all the years she spends with St. John, in all the apostolic ministries in Ephesus and Asia Minor. She is silent as he brings her back to Jerusalem for the council of the apostles. Silent as she goes up on Mount Zion across the street from where the Last Supper was celebrated and falls asleep in her dormition, silent as she's buried on the Mount of Olives next to the Garden of Gethsemane, silent as on the third day she is assumed into heaven. And now, dear brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the times that she appears, she barely says anything. And what is the richness of the silence of Mary? What is the richness of the silence of Our Lady of Mount Carmel? What is the richness of the silence of the one who bore the word in her heart and then conceived him in her womb? As somebody who loses my voice a lot, I've come to know the different flavors and textures of silence. And I want you to think about the times when we ourselves are without speech. Sometimes it happens for bad reasons. It happens due to hurt. It happens due to despair. It happens due to frustration. We just don't speak. We can't speak. We're bound. Sometimes we're silent and it's sinful. Silent when we're trying to hurt someone and give them the silent treatment out of bitterness. Silent because we're cowards and we dare not speak up. Silent because we have no love for justice and we watch horrors happen in front of our face and we say nothing. There are good silences too, the silence of rest, the silence of thought, the silence of a gentle glance at the sunrise. There are virtuous silences, that of humility, 
that of prudence, and that, and this is the one I've mastered the best, that of patience. Okay. But dear brothers and sisters, I think that her silence is certainly not bad, certainly not sinful, higher than good, higher than virtuous. Her silence is sacred. And what are the kinds of sacred silence? When we pray to the Lord without words. When we wait for the Lord without words. And when the Lord arrives and all our words are taken from us. Her heart opening in prayer, resting and waiting, opening in prayer, resting and waiting, rising in ecstasy and falling to pray for the world. Her heart was as the Garden of Carmel, grown rich in silence. Dear brothers and sisters, tonight we celebrate the Eucharist as the inestimable gift. After night, after night, after night of, I think we can all agree, many words, we come to the Word before whom all human speech fails. We come to the word that St. John Chrysostom cried out, let all mortal flesh keep silence. We come to the word who is so great that no human thought can conceive him, no human tongue can express him, no human life can reflect him as he is. On this holy day, in this holy place, we come to him in silence. And as we heard in our responsorial psalm, Mary, draw us after you. Draw us after you. So we ask her as a good mother, in the middle of the Mass, look at us and say, shh, we ask her as a good mother to draw us into her silence. And I'd like to reflect with the help of St. Alphonsus Liguori on that wonderful image we have of her in the book of Revelation. A woman standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, crowned with 12 stars. And she has that good silence, the silence of rest, the silence of human love. And that's like the moon beneath her feet because she enjoys in a moderate way all the changeable things of this world that shift like the moon. She wouldn't have been making the sun dance in the sky or flowers burst forth from Guadalupe or water shoot forth from Lourdes if she didn't value creation as the new Eve. But then she also has the virtues like those 12 stars, the virtue of humility, the virtue of prudence, and the virtue of patience. But St. Alphonsus tells us that when she is clothed with the sun, when she is radiant with the sun, when she is beaming with the sun, she is clothed with a light that does not change, clothed with a light that does not fail, clothed with a light that will not cease, clothed with a light that is eternal. And that comes from her sacred silence. That glorious, incredible rest of mind and will and tongue, recognizing that you stand before the inexpressible.
and will do so forever. Dear brothers and sisters, at the conclusion of this novena, under the instruction of St. Albert, guided by the hand of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, let us spend the rest of this Mass in quietness of mind, in quietness of heart, in quietness of memory, in quietness of soul, approaching the inestimable gift, which is so great, so profound, that he snatches speech away and is rightly received in silence. God bless you all.